Good evening, everyone. I'm Michael Ulrich, director of NYU Washington, D.C., and I'm pleased to welcome you to tonight's event, co-sponsored with the John Bradamus Center of New York University. We are pleased to host a conversation with author Michael Konsowitz. Oh, I said it wrong. No, that's okay. Oh, got it right. Oh, good. <laughs> to discuss his new book, They Said No to Nixon, Republicans Who Stood Up to the President's Abuses of Power. NYU Wagner professor Timothy Neftali will serve as interloker for the discussion, and despite the reception rumors, there will be no surprise guest appearance from Michael Cohen. Allow me to introduce our special guests. With a joint appointment in history and Wagner, Timothy Natali is a clinical associate professor of public service and a clinical associate professor of history. A native of Montreal and a graduate of Yale with a doctorate in history from Harvard, he writes on national security and intelligence policy, international history, and presidential history. He came to NYU Wagner after serving as the founding director of the Federal Richard, President Richard Nixon Library and Museum. His work has appeared in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Slate, and Foreign Affairs, and he is also seen regularly on television as a commentator on contemporary history. Our author is the Cold War Collection Specialist at the Taminent Library and Robert Wagner Lab Labor Archives at New York University. He previously worked for the National Archives at the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum and received his PhD from the University of California, Irvine. His work has appeared in the History News Network, the Los Angeles Times, and the Washington Post. Please join me in welcoming our guests. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, there are a lot of Michaels around. Um, so this, uh, this is going to be an opportunity to learn about Michael Consuwitz's book uh, through a conversation between the two of us. Um, Michael uh, was my assistant at the Nixon Library um, and then did even greater things, uh, more important things. And, but before, we, before he gives you the first taste of his research and, and we talk about the real reg nuggets in his book, I, given that we just mentioned another Michael, Cohen, what you witnessed, what we all as a nation witnessed uh, yesterday was saying yes to a president on the part of a party. And uh, this, what you're about to learn from Michael may depress you, but it's not supposed to depress you. It's about the same party saying no to a president. Uh, and Michael will explain why they said no. Uh, that, and th one of the things that you should be keeping in mind as you listen to us, and then ultimately we will take your questions, of course, is whether the country has so changed and the party in question has so changed in the last 50 years that this phenomenon that is quite remarkable that Michael will be explaining to you is not, is, is not possible again. It can't be repeated. So that's something to keep in mind as we talk. Can, can the party that said no to Richard Nixon say no to the current president? Um, Michael, you've got something you want to share with us. Yeah, uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you to the Broadhem Center for organizing this event. Uh, but I'm going to start things off with uh, actually a selection from the Nixon White House tapes. Uh, this is Richard Nixon. Uh, let me just cue up the audio. This is Richard Nixon in August of 1972. It's a very important summer, roughly about six weeks after the Watergate break-in, a few months before the 1972 presidential election. Uh, and Richard Nixon is voicing his frustration over the fact that people inside of his administration are not carrying out his orders. And in this conversation, he's really, really pissed off that no one is carrying out, uh, no one is politicizing the IRS the way that he wants it to be politicized. Uh, and you get a very in interesting quote out of this particular conversation. Here we go. So it's August 3rd, 1972. I think we have the audio queued up. Uh, okay, that's a different one. Here we go. Oh, does that help? 
talk about our culture of loyalty. And um, tell us a little bit about the culture of loyalty and the mission of Peace. Sure. Uh, there's Starting in the 1980s and 90s, there was a wave of historians who liked to separate Richard Nixon from the rising uh, conservative movement of the 1960s, 1970s. And they have a point. Richard Nixon's a very ideologically complex figure. Some of you in the room may be familiar with many of the liberal reforms that were passed during the Nixon years. But by listening, through the t listening to the tapes, what becomes very obvious, even if you're not even looking for it, but what becomes very obvious is that when push comes to shove, when Nixon believes he's actually in a battle with his enemies, he sides with the right. And the people, the, the, the conservative figures in his administration are the ones that he identifies as being the most loyal to him. And that is significant in terms of explaining the legacy of Richard Nixon and also his place within the political history of the last 50 to 60 years. And so what becomes very clear on the Nixon tapes is if you want to get close to Richard Nixon, you have to at the very least give a, a strong, you have to let him think that you're absolutely loyal to him. The people that get the most access to Richard Nixon, with the exception of maybe Henry Kissinger, who's a complicated figure, <laughs> uh, are people who show real loyalty to the president. Uh, and nine times out of 10, they're usually the conservatives within the administration. Uh, it, it may be some kind of amorphous cultural conservatism, but it's conservatism no nonetheless. And so I think that by focusing on Nixon's culture of loyalty, you get a much better sense of his broader legacy. Um, let's, uh, why don't you tell us about, you, you highlight the careers and the few episodes in the Nixon administration. Why don't you tell us about some of these careers that, that you use to tell the story of these I would say good government Republicans who say no to him. I suspect that with maybe one except with one exception, these are are stories that you've you've never heard before. Sure, and I believe the exception you're talking about is Elliot Richardson. And the Saturday Night uh, yeah, Massacre. Elliot Richardson is the hero of the Saturday Night Massacre. I, w we can talk about him later, but many of the other Republicans who are featured in this book, and almost all of them are Nixon appointees, are 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 bureaucrats. And that's, that's a bad word for many people. <laughs> uh, but in this book, the bureaucrats are heroes. They're not political animals. And that is really why Richard Nixon never feels all that comfortable with them. Even if they get selected for high-ranking appointments, they're usually just prestige. Uh, for, they're, they're, they're things, to, they're someone like George Shultz, as conservative as he may be, he's picked because Richard Nixon knows that he brings prestige to the administration. Never feels particularly clo close to George Shultz. And that's clear on that one particular conversation. Uh, in the summer of 1972, as Schultz is acting as a very important ro roadblock to Nixon's plans to completely take over the IRS and audit several hundred individuals whose only crime is opposing the President of the United States. These are not organizations. This is not some kind of hazy territory where organizations may have violated some, some, you know, some law. We're talking about individuals who oppose the President. And the President of the United States, using his, his closest advisors, are trying to take over the IRS that summer and fall of 1972, just weeks before their landslide victory over George McGovern. Uh, one of their key targets is Larry O'Brien, who is also going to be a target <laughs> in the Watergate break-in. Tell us, what, why, why is the President so obsessed with Larry O'Brien? Well, Larry O'Brien is a prominent Democrat then head of the DNC. Uh, there's obviously weird parallels to 2016. Uh, but Larry O'Brien was someone who Are you was saying he's the John Podesta of the <laughs> yes. story? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Maybe we should be very straightforward about this. I don't know if that's this. a compliment or an in insult to Larry O'Brien. <laughs> or to John Podesta. Given but anyway. Yeah, given the results of the 2016 election. But uh, Larry O'Brien was born out of the Kennedy era Democratic Party. And he was identified as someone who was a fierce loyalist to John F. Kennedy. That's how Richard Nixon saw him. And Richard Nixon was determined to screw Larry O'Brien. He's top of the list. And so in 1970, there's a reason the Watergate burglars went after Larry O'Brien. There's no evidence that they received a specific order from the president. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that Richard Nixon was ranting and raving about Larry O'Brien throughout his presidency, <laughs> but especially after the summer of 1971. That is, that is very clear. 
Uh, so the break-in into the Watergate was... So imagine if you had the president saying, lock him up, lock him up, yes. lock him up, all the time. Just not publicly, okay? And so what's interesting about Larry O'Brien is uh, this is one situation where the IRS does cave a bit, um, and George Shultz caves a bit. They're very hesitant to bring Larry O'Brien in, but after repeated demands to bring Larry O'Brien in that summer, he is brought in for an interview. The then commissioner of the IRS, Johnny Walters, a Republican from South Carolina, someone who had worked in the Justice Department uh, for two different administrations, uh, he was very unwilling to do this. But George Shultz, the new Secretary of the Treasury, decides to cave on that particular order. Well, why don't we tell everybody what the, what the rules are, okay, about how the IRS is supposed to operate. So you know the difference between what Nixon wanted to do and what you're supposed to do. What are the rules? Well, one thing that I think is worth bringing up um, it's, it's more of a standard, it's more of an ethical practice, is that during the middle of a presidential election, you try to avoid these types of investigations. And that's something that Johnny Walters was arguing for throughout 1972, because Larry O'Brien was not the only time he stood up to the president. And Larry O'Brien, keep in mind, is the, the chair of the Democratic National Committee. So he is a very visible Democratic target. And if you're gonna audit his tax returns, in an election year, it's hard to argue that you're not being political. And Johnny and Walters went right? as far to say that he would, uh, he would do this investigation, but after the election. Yeah, so, 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 the, so you, have the, you have the president putting pressure on the commissioner of the IRS to do this, and this is a totally political move. And the commissioner says, not during an election year. Yeah. But, but, but George Shultz tells him to go along with the plan. And so that's interesting, is that you know on that tape that we, we just listened to, Nixon is complaining about George Shultz. He knows that Shultz is you know, kind of bending to his will, and, but it's still not good enough. The fact that Shultz wasn't thrilled about this order and didn't immediately carry it out was enough of a sign of weakness, uh, of weakness for, for the president. Um, one of the things that, uh, that I think a lot of folks, when they think about Watergate, focus on is they think about the break-in. I meant we were talking about Larry Bryan, who's sort of a link. But, but Nixon's crimes uh, encompass much more than the cover-up after the break-in. We all focus on that because, in large measure, the country focused on that. These are the other constitutional crimes that he engaged in that were never as well known, although the House Judiciary Committee came to understand them. And that, that's why you have the second article of impeachment, which Republicans as well as Democrats supported. But it's these abuses of power that these Republican civil servants could do something about, and they tried. Yeah, and what gets lost in what I believe is our foggy collective memory of Watergate is that the enemies list was not carried out. I think because of our mostly justified cynicism about Richard Nixon uh, and just uh, I guess civil service as a whole coming out of Watergate, if you're just you know paying attention to, if you're not a Nixon historian, you're not knee deep in this stuff, it's quite understandable that you'd be cynical about all this. And you have some vague awareness of the enemies list and you just assume it was carried out. Well, that's not the case and that's an important story. <laughs> uh, because unlike the order, uh, the Larry O'Brien order, George Schultz does have Johnny Walters' back when it comes to blocking the enemies list. Johnny Walters has a meeting with John Dean, who then is one of the president's men. This is before John Dean turned against the president and is now apparently someone that Donald Trump detests, <laughs> probably because of his many conversations with Roger Stone. Uh, but John Dean meets with Johnny Walters, gives him a list of 700 individuals, and tells him to initiate audits on hundreds and hundreds of the president's enemies. In this case, Johnny Walters goes to George Shultz and George Shultz recognizes this as a real danger to the country. And so with O'Brien, he caved. This order, he stood up to the president of the United States. And that's an important story. Uh, it's quite understandable that the Watergate break-in gets a lot of attention and that the 18 and a half minute gap gets a lot of attention. These are incredibly interesting stories. But what gets lost in the shuffle is this story of, and as you said, it's documented by the House in 1973, 
and it's a part of the articles of impeachment uh, of impeachment against the president. But it gets lost in the broader narrative of Watergate. And what this book tries to do is is try to raise a little bit more awareness uh, uh, surrounding the Republicans who actually did stand up to the president. Um, I think uh, when we were at the library, uh, I think it's fair to say that you shared this um, reaction that what what we found uh, underreported was the role the Republicans had played in defending the country against a Republican president. And ultimately, you write your dissertation about that. Um, maybe, maybe we should play. Maybe we should play that clip from George Schultz. Sure, and uh, what this is is uh, an interview that actually Tim did for the Nixon Library. Tim uh, was, of course, the first federal director of the Richard Nixon Library. He uh, began a, a very, very comprehensive oral history project for the library, about 150 participants, correct? Or 150 yeah, 100, interviews, 150. around 150. And this is one of them. This is George Schultz talking about the IRS, uh, the enemies list order. Uh, but this clip is from 2007. He's talking about events that occurred in September 1972. Uh, so he's, um, so he, you, you can hear him recount his experience when the president asked him to do something he did not want to do. Johnny Waters came to me and said, John Dean, the president's counsel, has just brought me a list of, I think, 50 names of people and wants a full field investigation of them. That's a very unpleasant thing to have happen to you. What should I do? And I said, don't do it. And he said, well, what shall I tell John Dean when he asked me how it's going? I said, tell him that you report to me. If he has a problem, he's got a problem with me. So they never brought it up with me, although on the tapes there's discussion between the president and John Dean about who I think I am holding this up, but it was an improper use of the IRS and I wouldn't do it. When it came to anything of that kind where you're using the power of government, I think, and I held that and I stuck to it, that you've got to do it properly. And I was being asked to do something improper and I wouldn't do it. And I think Things like that had been done before. Um, and so maybe the president thought he was just doing what others had done, but anyway, not with me. Some people in this room will remember Paul O'Neill. He's still alive, but they'll remember him because uh, he really didn't like Dick Cheney, and he was Secretary of the Treasury. So this is this is George Shultz, who was Secretary of the Treasury when Richard. Uh, he was also Secretary of Labor uh, in the uh, Nixon administration. Um, Paul O'Neill was Secretary of the Treasury in the first couple of years of the George W. Bush administration. So some of you may remember him. And he disagreed uh, with the president over something called Iraq. And uh, ultimately, he, he, he loses his job. Uh, but Paul O'Neill has a Nixon story. And the kind of uh, single-mindedness and independence of thought that some of us came to identify him with in the W period, he actually showed as a much, much lower level uh, civil servant in the Nixon period, and maybe we should maybe you should tell the story of Paul O'Neill. Yeah, and it's a, it's a really interesting story. It's one it's another one that involves George Shultz, um, but it's one that Shultz doesn't talk about, or at least hasn't yet, uh, not on the record, anyways. Um, but Paul O'Neill was e an assistant director at the OMB. That's the Office of Management and Budget. It's a relatively new created off newly created office in the White House, formerly the the Bureau of the Budget. And Paul O'Neill is working in the OMB alongside with two other assistant directors, Kenneth Dam and William Morrill. Uh, Dam is a Republican, Morrill is an independent. 
George Shultz was their boss at the OMB for a couple of years. And starting in the spring of 1972, they started to receive word that the president of the United States was interested in punishing colleges and universities that received defense uh, department funds, funds for research, weapons-related research. And the number one recipient was MIT, received roughly about $100 million a year in the early 1970s. And so what's, what's very interesting about this order is that it's connected to something else that some Nixon historians often argue when it comes to the Nixon and the tapes. These, these orders often get dismissed as rants, as just Nixon letting off some steam. And this MIT order could really be dismissed as that if, if you just listen to one conversation. Nixon first brings up this idea in the spring of 1970, after the invasion of Cambodia, the Kent State Massacre, his weird trip to the Lincoln Memorial <laughs> at four in the morning. Uh, and he brings us up by this idea to cut funds to MIT and other elite universities that are getting tens of millions of dollars from the federal government. He wants to cut the funds off because they have too many anti-war protests, the administrators are too soft with these radicals, uh, the professors are even softer, and we should take these funds out and distribute them to other universities. So that, that's, that, that's a very important component, because when I, when I talk about this order with some students, students who are interested in you know, demilitarizing campuses across the country, they say, well, this is not a bad thing. Well, what he wants to do is take money from M MIT and then give it to schools that he, he's identified as pro-Nixon. And in his, at one point, he mentions Ohio State, Tennessee, you know, schools in the South and Midwest. Whether they're pro-Nixon or not, it's beside the point. He thinks that they're pro-Nixon. And Nixon brings this up first in 1970, then again in 1971. It appears on the tapes a couple times in the summer of 1971. But then starting in the spring of 1972 with a new wave of anti-war protests, Nixon becomes incredibly determined to carry out this order. So what's clear is that for two years, his closest advisors were ignoring this order, presumably just hoping it would go away. <laughs> but in April and May of 1972, this order gets enough momentum where it's brought to the OMB. And Paul O'Neill and the assistant directors of the OMB say no in the spring of 1972. You can see this in Caspar Weinberger's notes. Caspar Weinberger replaces George Schultz as the head of OMB. And Schultz also says no to this order. It comes up again, though, nine months later in January of 1973. And the order is brought to Paul O'Neill and his colleagues by H.R. Alderman. And this is one situation where O'Neill thought the order was serious enough where the three assistant directors uh, threatened to resign. They also met with George Schultz, who was no longer their boss. And that, that's very interesting. But they went to George Schultz, told them about what they were dealing with, and Schultz said, leave it to me, I'll, I'll figure it out and they backed down. But they were incredibly close to resigning, made it clear to H.R. Haldeman that the OMB would not be with them in carrying out this order. The order pops up in the archives a few more times. Caspar Weinberger, Schultz's replacement, is delivering detailed reports to the president throughout late 72, early 73. This is an order that could have easily been carried out in 1973, 74, but Watergate becomes a national story. It comes up one more time in the summer of 1973, before the tapes are cut off, where Nixon awkwardly jokes about the order with George Shultz, saying, well, George Shultz didn't want to punish his friends at MIT. And it's at a cabinet meeting. Everyone laughs awkwardly. And that's the only time it comes up. Nixon never directly brings it up to George Shultz. And Nixon's plan to punish liberal left, whatever you want to call them, universe, colleges and universities, just for tolerating anti-war protests, never comes to fruition. And so Paul O'Neill and these other, uh, Paul O'Neill, who's a Republican, as you said, resists, resists uh, George W. Bush's worst instincts in terms of policies in the early 2000s, did the same when it came to unethical orders in the early 1970s. And, and just to keep, you know, we, um, Mike, Mike is focusing on, on specific orders. Just to keep in mind why this matters, okay? It's, it's, that it's the concept of whether you have a government, we have a government, that is not completely political. In other words, that when you apply for a loan, or you apply for an NIH grant, or an NEA grant, that, that maybe, just maybe, the decision will rest on the quality of your application 
and not on some political bias that you can't control for. Now, if, if, you are all, if you're cynical, you'll say, well, this is always going to be political, in which case none of this story matters. But what's really quite remarkable is that the people that Mike studied actually believed that there was an ethos in the federal government that was professional, that you had an obligation not to be political. You may be skeptical of that, but, the, but that's, that's why there are the fights over an order. After all, how easy is it to give the president what he wants? You're working for him. You know, he'll pat you on the back. He might give you, he might give you some kind of promotion. And they decided to find ways to prevent the president from getting what he wanted because they thought it would corrupt the system. Whether the system was the IRS, where we as citizens have a right to believe that IRS audits are due to either suspicious entries or the luck of the draw, whereas Nixon wanted to be political, or the case of, of, of uh, universities applying for federal grants, where the federal grant will be dispersed based on the quality of the university's program and application. Um, because what's, what's at, the, at issue here is whether a government can operate in a nonpartisan way, because so much of the government is not elected, right? And that's what was at stake. And I think what's, maybe this is obvious, but I, I think what's really important to, to emphasize here is that these individuals are directly opposing the president. They're not slow walking, they're not hoping that these orders will go away. They're not taking memos off of a president's desk. They're not writing anonymous op-eds. In some cases, the in, these individuals are risking their careers. Now, you could say maybe they have support systems where it'll be okay, but th they're still risking their careers in standing up to the president, all right? There are plenty of individuals spread throughout the Nixon administration, even his own chief of staff who recognize, recognizes the danger in some of these orders, but they try to appease the president and just hope that it goes away. These individuals are different, okay? They, they have given up on the idea of being promoted within the administration, and they are willing to stand up for their beliefs. That is significant, and that's a very important contrast to what we've seen over the last two to three years. Maybe we should talk about Elliot Richardson. Sure. Uh, Elliot Richardson, who's featured on the cover of the book, uh, on the, I guess, our right side, your left. Uh, Elliot Richardson is probably a figure, or at least one of the figures, who really embodies the old liberal Republican establishment. Comes from Massachusetts. Uh, not a very charismatic speaker, not really a political creature, even though I think he thought he was one, uh, but comes out of Massachusetts, Harvard educated, really, like I said, really embodies the establishment that Nixon detested, okay? But he's picked to be Richard Nixon's undersecretary of state, defends Richard Nixon during the invad invasion of Cambodia, even though some of his staff actually resigns and Richardson's own feelings are a bit, a bit uh, mysterious, but he just decides to defend Richard Nixon's actions in Cambodia, is then awarded shortly after that with an appointment to head up the uh, uh, Department of Health, Education, and Warf uh, Welfare, HEW, has quiet battles with the president over policy issues, including one issue that's been in the news quite a bit, uh, federal child care. Richardson backs a federal child care program. Nixon vetoes that, that uh, legislation in late 1971. It's an embarrassment to Elliot Richardson and other civil servants, Republican civil servants, who were supporting federal child care in late 1971. The reason I bring that up is that that's just one of several policy disputes between the more liberal, moderate-minded Elliot Richardson and Richard Nixon, who often gets credit as being the last liberal president. Richardson is then picked to be the uh, Secretary of Defense in January of 1973, but that appointment is a relatively short one because in the spring of 1973, Watergate becomes a national story. And Elliot Richardson ends up becoming the Attorney General of the United States. And that's, that's fascinating because much like our current era, Richard Nixon feels like he has to pick Elliot Richardson. 
because he's someone who's just loyal enough, has proven his loyalty during certain times of crisis, but also will be trusted by, and th this is almost a direct quote, the goddamn establishment. You hear that on the tapes. Nixon and Kissinger say that shortly after Richardson's appointment. Uh, in, in the fall of 1972, just a few months before the, this appointment, Nixon is debating whether or not to keep Richardson in the administration. And he says at one point, I guess you have to keep someone who, uh, has, who actually cares about people. <laughs> and he's only, it, when, if you actually hear this quote, there's, there's no laughter. <laughs> John Ehrlichman says he sure has credibility on that. So it gives you an idea of why Richardson was kept in the administration, even though Nixon was never close to him. You can hear in the conversations, they, they just are not, they are not, they're not buddies. <laughs> But he's picked to be Attorney General of the United States because Nixon feels like he's on the ropes and needs to pick someone who's trusted by the establishment. The very next day after he announces that Elliot Richardson's gonna be the next Attorney General of the United States, Richard Nixon is shoving an FBI agent in the White House. <laughs> it's the very first incident that Elliot Richardson has, has to deal with, even before he's officially appointed, but he's about to become Attorney General of the United States. And it becomes very clear in May of 1973, days after Nixon picks Elliot Richardson, picks the, you know, the, the, the prestige pick, and it becomes very clear that these two are not going to get along. Elliot Richardson has a lot of liberal and moderate advisors who are, have always been suspicious of Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon knows that those advisors are advising Elliot Richardson. And so by the end of, of, of that May of 1973, it's clear on the tapes that Richard Nixon regrets his decision to choose Elliot Richardson. What he doesn't know is that Elliot Richardson is actually being quite kind to Richard Nixon, or as kind as he can be, that spring, summer, and even into the early fall of 1973. Before we get to the fall of 73, when something happens that you get, we, we discuss all the time now. It's an episode, the Saturday Night Massacre in the Watergate story that you hear about all the time, and it is important. Tell us how Richardson's career gets wrapped up with that of the special prosecutor initially. So in May of 1973, Elliot Richardson, in order to be uh, approved by the Senate, says he will pick a Watergate special prosecutor. Remember, Democrats are in control of the Senate, much more power than today, and he is basically backed into a corner and, and he has to promise that he will pick a Watergate special prosecutor. So he makes that promise. He looks for a special prosecutor. And Richardson's archives show that no one wanted the job. <laughs> Remember, this is May of 1973. It's less than a year after Richard Nixon wins, you know, uh, wins a landslide victory over McGovern. No one knows where this is headed in May of 1973. Eventually, he convinces Archibald Cox, his former law professor at Harvard, uh, former solicitor general uh, during the 1960s, you know, close friend of uh, John F. Kennedy, Linda Johnson to a certain extent. Uh, he's picked to be the Watergate special prosecutor. And later on, Nixon points to this moment as proof of a conspiracy against him. And many Nixon loyalists believe that, oh, this was, this was a rigged game. However, the tapes show that Nixon didn't think much of Cox at the very beginning. Al Haig, his new chief of staff, is telling him, oh, we looked into him, he's not a serious guy. And so it's very interesting that they are also, they're quite confident that Cox is not gonna cause any problems for them in May of 1973. That changes within a matter of days, but it, it adds an interesting uh, kind of wrinkle to the narrative that's spun by a lot of Nixon loyalists to this day. And do you think it's fair to say that if Elliot Richardson had not had this particular view of government, um, he's partisan, he, he wants to be a Republican president someday, but, but he also believes in the institution. And Nixon yeah. knows that. And uh, it, you, it comes up constantly in the conversations where but, Rich, Nixon s says, and he's probably drunk while he's saying this, you know, this will take you to the top. He knows that Richardson's an ambitious figure. Well, that's something Nixon would do. I mean, Nix, Nixon was a master at cultivating loyalty by promising political assistance. I was going to ask you, though, that if, if Richardson <coughs> had been a dedicated partisan, 
like, I don't know, do we know any in this era? I don't know, Devin Nunes maybe, I don't know. Would he have chosen somebody like his law professor at Harvard? No, no, I, he definitely wouldn't. And that's why Archibald Cox, after the Saturday Night Massacre says, I don't think that uh, this would have happened without Elliot Richardson. So even though Elliot Richardson had many moments of weakness when he faced off with the president, when it really counted during the Saturday Night Massacre, you know, he, he stood up for this country against a corrupt president. Cox recognized that, the majority of the country recognized that, and we, we, we definitely benefited from his actions that fall. So maybe, why don't you tell people, I mean, what was the Saturday Night Massacre, and, it, and then we can talk about its relevance to today. Sure, uh, I'll try to do a, sh a short version of this without uh, going too much into the details, but the Saturday Night Massacre occurred on October 20th, 1973. So this is uh, five and a half months after Richardson's appointment. Uh, that week, Richard Nixon had to make a decision when it came to nine tapes that had been subpoenaed, subpoenaed by the courts. And the plan he came up with that week was something that was known as the Stennis Compromise. This is where... Yeah, the people who know it yes. are laughing right now. <laughs> This is where a, preposterous. a Democratic <laughs> senator, see th that part may sound good because to maybe some of the younger people, but Why this is, Southern, yeah, Southern Democratic senator, uh, pro-war Southern Democratic senator, uh, someone who was quite friendly with Richard Nixon, would be the only person who would have access to those nine tapes. <laughs> so this plan is, is proposed a little less than a week before the Saturday Night Massacre. Okay, so this pro-war, pro-Nixon Democratic senator would be the only one to listen to the tapes. The other problem, aside from his, uh, his background, was that he was 72, 73 years old. Uh, it was the 1970s, people aged a little quicker back then. But the, the mo even more important part is that he was mugged outside of his home earlier that year. And he was already known to be hard of hearing. You, you just listened to one of the tapes. This would be the man who would be responsible for producing transcripts that would then be handed over to Archibald Cox and his staff at the Watergate Special Prosecution Force. That's known as the Stennis Compromise. It's brought to Elliot Richardson, and Elliot Richardson, ever the loyal moderate who just wants to find a solution get, to get out of this mess, even though he's being yelled at by his advisors, some of his closest advisors are quite angry with him for even taking this proposal seriously. He says, well, I, th I believe this can at least be the beginning of a negotiation. He brings it to Archibald Cox. Archibald Cox politely declines, <laughs> but says, I'm willing to further negotiate this whole issue to come to a compromise. Nixon, his reaction is quite predictable. He says, nope, this is my final offer, and this leads to the Saturday Night Massacre. I'm skipping over some things, but that eventually brings us to that weekend in October of 1973, where Nixon orders his attorney general to fire Ar Archibald Cox. R Richardson says no. He spends you know, 48 hours leading up to this in, in a lot of anguish. This is a very difficult decision for him. That's clear on the records. It's clear whenever you, t you talk to anyone who was close to Elliot Richardson. He did not take joy in doing this, but he decides to resign in protest. His deputy attorney general, William Ruckelshaus, who had previously served as the head of the EPA, this is actually a very easy decision for him. <laughs> he decides he's going to quit. He's going to also resign in protest. The White House actually fires him right before he officially resigns. <laughs> and then this goes to the third in line, Robert Bork. Solicitor general didn't even know he was next in line. <laughs> this is how <laughs> unprecedented all these things, uh, this, this whole event was. Uh, but he's third in line. He had previously stated his beliefs that he thought the president had every right to end this investigation. Seemed fairly sincere in, 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 in his beliefs. And he carries out the order and fires Archibald Cox. And that sets off what media calls the Saturday Night Massacre. And for the first time that week, you have a plurality of voters supporting the idea of impeachment. Nixon's approval ratings were dropping prior to this, but the idea of impeachment, this, this is a, a very important turning point when it comes to that story. Um, if you remember the number of times the current president uh, tweeted about how much he hated the witch hunt, he did it a few times. 
Um, and remember how many times he attacked Mueller. And there was a great fear. There was such fear that he would fire Mueller that even some Republicans were talking about passing some kind of law to protect Mueller. Go back in time, and Richard Nixon was talking the same way, though, though he wouldn't have known who Mueller was, um, about Cox, fuming about Cox. Now, unfortunately, the taping system at that point had been shut off because Alexander Butterfield had revealed it to the Senate Watergate Committee, which then had him reveal it to the world. So there's no taping system. So we don't have the fuming from the, the fall. We have the fuming from before, but as, as Michael has explained, in the beginning, the, the Nixon White House thought Cox was manageable. But here's the thing. The president wanted to fire Cox. And he just wanted to fire Cox. And his inner circle knew this would be bad. Um, and uh, they, cry, they tried desperately to prevent, not prevent him, but, dis, but sort of calm him down. And the Stennis Compromise was a way for the White House staff and Richardson to calm the president down so he wouldn't do the dumb thing of firing Cox. Because not only did he want to fire Cox, he wanted to shut down the entire investigation. And now you can see why the American people were so afraid. This wasn't about replacing Cox with another special prosecutor. This was ending it all, completely. No more independent investigation from Watergate, because the president said it was a witch hunt. Um, that really, I think, ties this era to that, because it's just the president didn't say this publicly. And the only reason you get a new Watergate special prosecutor, it's Leon Jaworski, is because the American public was so enraged by this decision. And members of Congress. Let's yeah. not forget, well, that too. and members of Congress. Yeah. Not just Democrats, but Republicans too. After all, this may strike some of you as, as uh, surprising, but uh, the Watergate investigation, the public Watergate investigation, had been going on for uh, 16 months, 15 months, before the Saturday Night Massacre. And more importantly, before Democrats in the leadership in Congress talked about impeachment. So unlike our era, where the word, the, the big I word, has been talked about, not by the leaders, but by many in Congress, wasn't the case in 1972 and 73. Americans were afraid of the idea of impeachment. There was no one old enough to remember a Andrew Johnson. And in 1868, Andrew Johnson had been impeached but then acquitted by the Senate. Impeachment is a bit of a misnomer. It's half the process. If you want to re remove a president, you have to, you, you, they have to be tried by the Senate. And two thirds of the Senate have to uh, find the, the, the president guilty. Well, Andrew Johnson was not found guilty. And the historical lesson, we could debate whether that's true, but the historical lesson was impeachment's a bad thing. It's, it's anti-democratic, and it is used by people who don't like the president to get rid of the president. And that would mean congressional tyranny. You allow this to work, and Congresses will throw out presidents they don't like. So that was the received wisdom in the American polity for over 100 years. So nobody was thinking about impeachment for Nixon until Nixon shuts down or tries to shut down the Watergate, whole Watergate uh, prosecution, the whole Watergate investigation. So he pushes the entire country across a psychic line, not just Democrats. Because Democrats could have started this process from the get-go because they ran the House and the Senate. But it was a bigger deal than that. It wasn't about um, censoring the president. Yeah, and in the days after the Saturday Night Massacre, there were many reports of, of cars honking in front of the White House, people pulling signs saying, honk for impeachment. <laughs> and just uh, the whole White House lawn was filled with these, these, these honks from people who were actually supporting this idea that had been considered a r radical for a century. 
And Tim, of course, lays out a lot of this in his recent chapter in, uh, in the book Impeachment <laughs> that just came out a few months ago, along with John Meacham and Peter Baker and uh, Jeffrey Engel, right? Thank you. Yes, and you were here, actually, to talk about it just a few months ago. And it really gives you a blow-by-blow -blow account of not only the public's attitude regarding uh, impeachment, but also congressional figures and how they viewed all of this and how eventually they supported the idea of impeachment. Not all, but many changed their minds in 1974. Uh, that fall, though, I think this is another important difference. You know, we, the, the public sees images of the Watergate Special Prosecution Office being shut down by FBI agents. You have people in the media comparing this to Nazi Germany. You have the mainstream media come up with the phrase, Saturday Night Massacre. And that's a very powerful thing. Now, I would say much of the public would have been repulsed by by this whole event, even without the media. But the media does play a key role in, in mobilizing the public's anger. And that's a very, very important difference between 1973 and 2019. Imagine if the media tried to come up with a phrase similar to the Saturday Night Massacre in 2019. What would happen shortly after that? You would get a pro-Trump meme or hashtag to combat you know, the, the, the mainstream media's narrative regarding whatever Trump happens to do in 2019. And that's something we need to confront when trying to figure out what's going to happen next in this country. Before we turn to questions, uh, another difference is this, too. Donald Trump seems to fire everybody who doesn't do what he wants them to do. Why didn't Nixon fire all these people? I mean, after all, he seems to tolerate them. Uh, that's a, and that's another interesting difference that I think I'm still figuring out, as uh, many people are, but I, I've been thinking about this a lot. And this is what, one thing that does make Richard Nixon different from Donald Trump. As unstable of a figure as Richard Nixon was, as dangerous of a president as he was, there was still a part of him that cared about norms and cared about his legacy. That part would sometimes get pushed back you know, or, or tucked away in some hidden drawer in his brain, but it was there. You could see it in how he behaves after he resigns, and it definitely shapes a lot of his decisions, particularly his appointment with Elliot Richardson. He wants to look like a normal president. I don't think we're, we're dealing with that today in 2019. Uh, let's have some questions. Yes. Oh, please, if you have a question, Ellen, uh, go to the microphone. There are microphones. Uh, my question is actually about the Democrats not bringing up impeachment in the months preceding the Saturday Night Massacre because of one gigantic impediment to impeachment. Spiro Agnew. Can you speak about that effect on Nixon and what happened? Well, I can talk about uh, Elliot Richardson's own relationship with Spiro Agnew. Uh, Spiro Agnew was certainly aware of the details of, how, <laughs> of what Richardson felt. In 1968, Richardson was one of several prominent Republicans who opposed uh, Spiro Agnew as the vice presidential nominee. And Agnew never forgot that. Uh, and it's why he's convinced. And also, Agnew thought that Richardson was already plotting a primary battle with him in 1976. So Agnew was well aware that Elliot Richardson did not like him. Uh, and that, that, I mean, that, that was true. Elliot Richardson definitely thought Agnew was, was probably a more dangerous figure in the spring and summer of 1973. I don't know what Elliot Richardson, th Elliot Richardson thought after the Saturday Night Massacre, but prior to the Saturday Night Massacre, he definitely thought Spiro Agnew was uh, the, the more dangerous president. Uh, and I think that explains some of his, his behavior in the summer and fall of 1973. His advisors certainly thought that, even if he didn't say it out loud. And it's fair, wouldn't you say it's fair to say that Nixon viewed Spiro Agnew as impeachment insurance? Yes. Because Spiro Agnew, while he took a very good photograph, was no one thought he would be fit to be president. Um, but then he's, but then he pleads nola contendere, 
to, I don't know, 40 counts of bribery. This is a guy, okay. You know, you talk about chutzpah. <laughs> now, this is chutzpah. Chutzpah, it's bad, okay. I'm not suggesting that if you work for the city of Baltimore, you do this, but chutzpah is taking money um, as a, uh, in, you know, as a, some county guy in Baltimore. That's chutzpah. One kind of chutzpah. Continuing to take bribes when you're governor of Maryland, that's, that's another kind of chutzpah. But to continue to take bribes as pr vice president of the United States, and when I say bribes, I'm not talking about the bribes that Netanyahu apparently maybe <laughs> took or might have taken or will be indicted for tomorrow or maybe, which are bad, you know, cigars, things like that, not good for your health, political or otherwise. <laughs> We're talking about envelopes of cash Okay, envelopes of cash brought to the, the Vice President of the United States by various people in, in, in Maryland. Anyway, the Justice Department following on, on local investigative efforts by, I guess, the US Attorney in Baltimore, finds, you know, this is in the middle of the nation is concerned about the future of the President, and they discover, oh my God, N Nixon, Nixon, we don't know how much of a crook he is, but there's no doubt that Spiro Agnew, his vice president, is a crook. And to bring up Richardson again, this is a moment where he could have easily shut this investigation down. He had enough on his plate. And so whether it was because of pressure from the Nixon administration or because he just wanted to pick one battle at a time, he could have shut the Agnew invest investigation down, but he doesn't. You know, uh, th that happens the very same month as the Saturday Night Massacre, less than two weeks. Agnew is gone. So you think that a split-screen reality is something just in the 21st century. There was a split-screen reality for the, the nation in, the, in October of 1973. Um, so I'm just really curious to understand um, your perspectives on the role of social media today and how politicians are able to control the messaging and their own narratives to a degree that we have not seen in past administrations like the Nixon and how Nixon might have used those social media platforms to rewrite his uh, transgressions and potentially change um, the direction he went in. Do you have any thoughts on this? He tried, even without social media. He spent, um, and David Greenberg, who's a fine historian, you know, uh, has a whole sort of study of how Richard Nixon basically uh, continued the struggle, sort of the last campaign, for redemption, not actually to re for rehabilitation even more than redemption, because redemption, I think, requires admitting you did something wrong. He wanted rehabilitation. So even though he didn't have the social, social media, he used the tools that you had available in that era. I'm talking about the, the 80s and early 90s. Books, he put out, I don't know, 10 books? I mean, put out, I mean, say it that way. <laughs> um, he, uh, he went to Congress and, and talked to, to members of Congress. He, um, he went on television whenever he could. Um, and he found ways to be on the covers of magazines. Uh, to, to try to shape, to try to shape the, the discussion. He, his most important book is his memoirs. That actually comes out in the 70s. And then he appears in, uh, in a very, very highly watched inter set of interviews with David Frost, all of which are designed to shape the narrative about his, to spin about uh, his time in office. So to the extent that, that he could be, he was a media maven. And I suspect, were he alive today, he'd be a social media maven. And what Nixon and his closest advisors knew was that they could, uh, they could reach out to either moderates or liberal Democrats starting in the 1980s and appeal to their frustrations during the Reagan era. They knew that. Uh, and as you mentioned, David Greenberg has uh, written a lot about this. His book, Nixon's Shadow, really covers this in great detail. Uh, and so, so Nixon really tried to, to, I think, take advantage in the later years of his life to, to, uh, to appeal to those revisionist historians who wanted to find a new post-Watergate narrative regarding Richard Nixon. Uh, that, that only escalates after his death. 
1994. And it's something that never fully caught on, but it, it lingers. And it definitely lingers during the Trump presidency. It's something you could see a lot in social media, where people will say, Richard Nixon never did this. Richard Nixon seems good by comparison. Yeah, well, you heard this during the Bush years. You heard this from Republicans during the Obama years. Nixon, because Nixon's the standard in terms of presidential scandals, <laughs> or at least and I could hear the audience or say maybe he's not anymore, <laughs> but because Nixon has been the standard for nearly 50 years, it's a very easy political argument to make that whoever you happen to detest in 2019 is worse than Richard Nixon. I was gonna say, just Google worse than Watergate and see how many different books and articles you will see. It's, it's a trope, it returns. Um, one thing that is, and, and Michael has already mentioned it, I wanna, I wanna sort of uh, emphasize it. Richard Nixon would be spinning uh, right now. Uh, I don't mean in his grave, I meant <laughs> as, a, as, a, as, as a social media maven. But there's one difference, big one with Trump, and that's this business about norms. Richard Nixon believed you had to act a certain way to be taken seriously. He would not, uh, though he would admire Trump's dirty, tr the element, the dirty trickster in Trump. I mean, after all, Roger Stone, though I, uh, Richard Nixon didn't know Roger Stone during the presidency, he got to know him afterwards. The, the hard-edged, hardball player, um, Nixon admired. But Nixon didn't want you ever to think that he was one of them. Whereas we have a president now who doesn't mind his base seeing him as not only tough, but a dirty trickster. And that's different. So Nixon would be, he, Nixon would be more deceptive about the games he's playing. Uh, but he would be just as eager as our current president to spin. You're, you're definitely right, and you see, well, you hear that when he's talking about the right wing, when he's talking about the conservative movement. When he talks about Ronald Reagan, he describes them as a bunch of idiots, but he also says at one point that I'd rather have a dumb loyalist than a bright neuter. <laughs> <laughs> and that explains a lot about Richard Nixon's relationship to the right wing in the 1970s. You're next. Hi, so I was wondering, um, what was the most challenging part about writing the book? And if there's anything you'd wanted to include it but had to cut for one reason or another? Well, one chapter that I, I wanted to include, um, I mean, this, this started off as a dissertation, and you just want to finish the dissertation <laughs> as, as soon as possible. Uh, but one chapter that I, I, I wish I had more time to write w were all, was a chapter that focused on some of those orders that were slow walked that were sort of resisted, but not really, and try to dive further into the heads of, of people like H.R. Haldeman, uh, like Fred Malik, <laughs> and some of these figures who tried to avoid carrying out these orders, but ultimately did. Because I feel like that's, that, that is an important contrast to some of the heroes that are featured in my book. Uh, but I just simply did not have the time or resources to do that. Um, Last month I was, um, a couple of comments or questions. Um, I was in Philadelphia and I heard John Dean spoke at a conference I was at and he said he thought that if there was a Fox News talking about social media, like that he, he didn't, he wondered if there would be a Watergate if, if we had the kind of media we have now. Like you mentioned, the mainstream media at the time reporting on Nixon, most of the media was the mainstream media then. So that's one thought. And the other is, you wrote a book about these Republicans who said no to Nixon. And would you agree that they are the exception? Because, I mean, basically, you had people at the FBI and the Justice Department, the former AG, you know, um, all working against uh, American democracy. So, um, and then you have people like who you mentioned, Fred Malik, who seemed to be rehabilitated and shows up again, you know, in later years, unscathed. So, can you comment on that? Thanks. I'll quickly comment on Fred Malik very quickly. Um, I apologize, can't get into the details. So there's simply not enough time. But Fred Malik carried out Richard Nixon's order to count the number of Jewish civil servants in the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the summer of 1971 after the BLS delivered a unemployment report in a way that was not to Nixon's liking. He didn't think it was positive enough. Uh, 
And so Malik carried out that order. And yeah, he's still involved more or less in Republican Party politics. He's still involved in the private uh, Richard Nixon Foundation. There's actually now a theater at the Richard Nixon Library uh, that's named after Fred Malik and his wife. That's the introductory theater and the National Archives allowed that. That was after our time and yeah. I will say that in the same Nixon Library, talk about dissonance, there is a Watergate exhibit that talks about what Fred Malik did and talks about the counting of Jews and says that it's illegal and unconstitutional in the United States of America to, to act that way. Same library. And that, that's mm -hmm. featured in the Watergate exhibit uh, alongside actually the George Sh uh, Schultz clip that I played. I, I used to play that yeah. for students when I worked at the library and would give school tours. Uh, but to get back to your, your, your question, yes, they are exceptions. And there was plenty of, of, of loyalists in the Nic Nixon administration. I agree with you. <laughs> Nevertheless, these stories, I think, need to be brought up in order to better understand that era. And, and, and loyalists are not surprising historically. What's surprising are people who are risking their jobs to do the right thing. And that's an important part of the story, especially since our collective memory of these events over time, we forget that it wasn't partisan. There is a, there's a school of thought out there that believes that the um, near impeachment of Richard Nixon was an, a partisan matter. And, and there are many Americans, and we know this from having worked for the federal government in Southern California, there are many Americans who believe this. So when you tell them that no, in fact, there are Republicans, a significant number who recognize that the president was hurting the Constitution, they're surprised, and it's a story they need to know. Yeah. I think this is the last question. Thanks for your presentation. My name's Li Yang. <clears throat> I think you mentioned the Agnew, and the people will impeach him, or somebody, attorney general level, would oppose the, the Nixon. I just wonder, in our climate this time, you now maybe you want to impeach the the Trump, but in the national level, loyal to the people rather than to the president, do you think that kind of uh, integrity is higher now than before, or which cycle is getting worse? Did, did you? Did you well, I mean, is it yeah. do you compare, think? I'm sorry. Compared to the Agnew, do you want to impeach Agnew or fire Agnew right away? But now you don't fire people who are doing a very bad job. Instead, just get a cash, maybe they get a whole billions uh, of I think, assets. I, th I think the, uh, uh, the woman's question is, do you think that the level of integrity that you found among some in the Nixon administration we'd find today if we got the inner story of the Trump administration? It, uh, it's possible. I, gun to my head, I would say no. There's very little evidence. Um, we, I mean, we don't know what's happening in the Justice Department today. Uh, we don't know if there's any actual significant resistance. There could be. But based on what we've seen in terms of how people uh, actually work with President Trump, I don't have much hope. Tim may feel differently than, than I do. Thank you. Um, uh, well, I'm, uh, I have hope that so far we, our institutions are doing pretty well in this stress test. And the fact that Michael Cohen, the president's lawyer, faces a, um, a jail sentence uh, is a sign of a very strong institution. Because think of how many countries in the world where the president's lawyer would have gotten off, or in fact, uh, the person who was accusing the president's lawyer might have disappeared. So the, the fact that in this country, Mueller has not been fired and clearly is gonna finish his report, uh, the fact that the Justice Department has been able to indict, or actually grand juries to indict, people close to the president, um, that's a sign that the system is working. The fact that, that the courts have also opposed the president's efforts in some way is a sign that the system is working. 
And the fact that at the moment, some Republicans are even opposing the, the declaration of a national emergency is a sign that it, the institutions are working. That doesn't mean things are peachy, but um, what happened in the Watergate period was the institutions worked. It was a near run thing. I, 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 I don't, uh, what Mr. Dean said is really interesting. Um, there are a series of things you'd have to explain away, um, but as far as I can tell, it's not the, it, I don't know, Fox News would, would not have been able to save Richard Nixon if the Nixon tapes had come out. The Nixon tapes, when you have the person saying these things, although actually no one heard the tapes at that point. They were only getting transcripts. The tapes come out in the tri trials later. But when you have the president actually saying and ordering these things, and it's unimpeachable evidence, it makes it hard for even the lo greatest loyalist to, to, to support the president. And if you want to know how that works, you look at the careers of one Trent Lott, a congressman from Mississippi at the time, and a man named Charles Wiggins, a man who represented Richard Nixon's birthplace of Yorba Linda at the time. Both Republicans, both came out in the summer of 74 and said they would support the impeachment of Richard Nixon after having publicly defended him in the House Judiciary Committee. And why? Because of the evidence on the tapes. So if the tapes still come out, then the existence or non-existence of the Fox News doesn't matter. Whether that Fox News would have prevented Republicans from participating in a, in a, in a Watergate, is that a Watergate committee? I don't know. But the tapes are what made the difference in 74. I'll just add one more thing, uh, because I mean, that is all true. And figures like Trent Lott seem pretty sincere from what I can tell in terms of being uh, uh, eventually opposing Nixon in 1974. But we cannot ignore public opinion. Uh, not to be too much of a skeptic, but you know, only roughly what twenty-five to twenty-eight percent of the American people supported Richard Nixon. Donald Trump's approval ratings, even even though they are historically low, they haven't bottomed out. They dip down sometimes to the high thirties, and they tick back up to the low to mid forties, and that's where we've been for the last two and a half years. And so, without some kind of collapse in his approval ratings. I'm still skeptical uh, that we're going to see any, any meaningful change. And so I'll, I'll just add one more point. The, the forces that were behind Nixon in 1974, the forces, the, the, the people who never left Nixon's side, or in some cases jumped in the Nixon boat, because there were some conservatives who did not like Nixon until Watergate. All right, we have to, we have to acknowledge that too. They're there. Those, that part of the population has only grown since the mid-1970s, and that's what we're struggling with today in the age of Trump. Join me in thanking Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Tim. And uh, you can buy and should buy his book. Uh, they said no to Nixon. Thank you. And we say thank you. Thank you, Mike. And good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you, everyone.